Five O'Clock Tea by William Dean Howells. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. List of characters. Mr. Willis Campbell, read by Martin Geeson. Mrs. Amy Summers, read by Ruth Golding. Mr. Bemis, read by Losh Rolander. Mrs. Roberts, read by Anise. Mr. Roberts, read by Sam E. Circle. Dr. Lawton, read by Brett Downey. Mrs. Kerwin, read by Elizabeth Clatt. Mr. Miller, read by Algie Pug. Mrs. Miller, read by Laura Harrington. Mrs. Crashaw, recorded by Rashada. Mrs. Wharton, read by Kalinda. Miss Bailey, read by Lucy Perry. Mrs. Bemis, read by Ariel Lipshaw. Young Mr. Bemis, read by David Lawrence. Narration by Kim Stish. Five O'Clock Tea. Scene One. Mrs. Summers, Mr. Willis Campbell. Mrs. Amy Summers, in a lightly floating tea gown of singularly becoming texture and color, employs the last moments of expectance before the arrival of her guests in marching up and down in front of the mirror which fills the space between the long windows of her drawing-room, looking over either shoulder for different effects of the drifting and eddying train, and advancing upon her image with certain little bobs and bows, and retreating from it with a variety of fan practice and elaborated curtsies, finally degenerating into burlesque, and a series of grimaces and mouths made at the responsive reflex. In the fascination of this amusement, she is first ignorant, and then aware of the presence of Mr. Willis Campbell, who on the landing space between the drawing-room and the library stands, hat in hand, in the pleased contemplation of Mrs. Summer's manoeuvres and contortions as the mirror reports them to him. Mrs. Summers does not permit herself the slightest start on seeing him in the glass, but turns deliberately away having taken time to prepare the air of gratification and surprise with which she greets him at half the length of the drawing-room. Mrs. Summers giving her hand. Why, Mr. Campbell, how very nice of you! How long have you been prowling about there on the landing? So stupid of them not to have turned up the gas. I wasn't much incommoded. That sort of pitch darkness is rather becoming to my style of beauty, I find. The only objection was that I couldn't see you. Do you often make those pretty speeches? When I confound them on fact. What can I say back? Oh, that I'm sorry I couldn't have met you when you were looking your best. Oh, do you think you could have borne it? We might go out there. On second thoughts, no. I shall ring to have them turn up the gas. No, let me. He prevents her ringing, and going out into the space between the library and the drawing-room, stands with his hand on the key of the gas burner. Now, how do I look? Beautiful. Campbell, turning up the gas. And now? Not half so well. Decidedly, pitch darkness is becoming to you. Better turn it down again. Campbell, rejoining her in the drawing-room. No, it isn't so becoming to you, and I'm not envious, whatever I am. You are generosity itself. If you come to phrases, I prefer magnanimity. Well, say magnanimity. Won't you sit down while you have the opportunity? She sinks upon the sofa and indicates with her fan an easy chair at one end of it, Campbell dropping into it. Are there going to be so many? You never can tell about five o'clock tea. There mayn't be more than half a dozen. There may be thirty or forty. But I wish to affect your imagination. You had better have tried it in some other kind of weather. It's snowing like... Mrs. Summers, running to the window and peeping out through the side of the curtain. It is, like cats and dogs. 
oh no you can't say that it only rains that way i was going to say it myself but i stopped in time mrs summer standing before the window with clasped hands no matter there will simply be nobody but bores they come in any sort of weather thank you mrs summers i'm glad i ventured out mrs summers turning about what then realizing the situation oh poor mr campbell oh don't mind me i can stand it if you can i belong to a sex thank you that doesn't pretend to have any tact i would just as soon tell a man he was a bore as not but i thought it might worry a lady perhaps worry i'm simply aghast at it did you ever hear of anything worse well not much worse what can i do to make you forget it i can't think of anything it seems to me that i shall always remember it as the most fortunate speech a lady ever made to me and they have said some flattering things to me in my time oh don't be entirely heartless wouldn't a cup of tea blot it out with a peak and freen she advances beseechingly upon him come i will give you a cup at once no thank you i would rather have it with the rest of the bores they'll be sure to come mrs summers resuming her seat on the sofa you are implacable and i thought you said you were generous no merely magnanimous i can't forget your cruel frankness but i know you can and i ask you to do it he throws himself back in his chair with a sigh <sighs> and who knows perhaps you were right about what my being a bore i should think you would know no that's the difficulty nobody would be a bore if he knew it oh some would i think do you mean me well no then i don't believe you would be a bore if you knew it is that enough or do you expect me to say something more no it's quite enough thank you he remains pensively silent mrs summers after waiting for him to speak bores for bores don't you hate the silent ones most campbell desperately rousing himself mrs summers if you only knew how disagreeable i was going to make myself just before i concluded to hold my tongue really what were you going to say do you actually wish to know oh no i only thought you wished to tell not at all you complained of my being silent did i i was wrong i will never do so again she laughs in her fan and i complain of your delay you can tell me now just as well as two weeks hence whether you love me enough to marry me or not you promised not to recur to that subject without some hint from me you have broken your promise well you wouldn't give me any hint how can i believe you care for me if you are false in this it seems to me that my falsehood is another proof of my affection very well then you can wait till i know my mind i'd rather know your heart but i'll wait why do you carry a fan on a day like this i ask to make a general conversation mrs summers spreading the fan in her lap and looking at it curiously i don't know oh yes for the same reason that i shall have ice cream after dinner today that's no reason at all 
are you going to have ice cream today after dinner i might if i had company oh i couldn't stay after hinting i'm too proud for that he pulls his chair nearer and joins her in examining the fan in her lap what is so very strange about your fan nothing i was just seeing how a fan looked that was the subject of gratuitous criticism i didn't criticize the fan he regards it studiously oh not the fan no i think it's extremely pretty i like big fans so good of you it's spanish that's why it's so large it's hand-painted too mrs summers leaning back and leaving him to the inspection of the fan you're a connoisseur mr campbell oh i can tell hand painting from machine painting when i see it it isn't so good thank you not at all now that fellow cavalier i suppose in spain making love in that attitude you can see at a glance that he's hand painted no machine painted cavalier would do it in that way and look at the lady's hand who ever saw a hand of that size before mrs summers unclasping the hands which she had folded at her waist and putting one of them out to take up the fan you said you were not criticizing the fan campbell quickly seizing the hand with the fan in it ah i'm wrong here's another one no bigger let me see which is the largest mrs summers struggling not very violently to free her hand mr campbell don't take it away you must listen to me now amy mrs summers rising abruptly and dropping her fan as she comes forward to meet an elderly gentleman arriving from the landing mr bemis how very heroic of you to come such a day isn't it too bad scene two mr bemis mrs summers mr willis campbell not if it makes me specially welcome mrs summers discovering campbell oh mr campbell campbell striving for his self-possession as they shake hands yes another hero mr bemis mrs summers is going to brevet everybody who comes to-day she didn't say heroes to me but you shall have your tea at once mr bemis she rings i was making mr campbell wait for his you don't order up the teapot for one hero <laughs> no indeed but i'm very glad you do for two the fact is i'm half frozen is it so very cold to campbell who presents her fan with a bow oh thank you to mr bemis mr campbell has just been objecting to my fan he doesn't like its being hand-painted as he calls it that reminds me of a californian gentleman whom i found looking at an andrea del sarto in the pity palace at florence one day by the way you've been a californian too mr campbell but you won't mind he seemed to be puzzled over it and then he said to me i was standing near him hand painted i presume <laughs> how very good to the maid who appears the tea lizzie you don't think he was joking why no it never occurred to me that he was you can't always tell when a californian's joking can't you not even adoptive ones adoptive ones never joke not even about hand-painted fans what an interesting fact she sits down on the sofa behind the little table on which the maid arranges the tea and pours out a cup 
then with her eyes on Mr. Bemis. Cream and sugar both, yes? Holding a cube of sugar in the tongs. How many? One, please. Mrs. Summers handing it to him. I'm so glad you take your tea au naturel, as I call it. What do you call it when they don't take it with cream and sugar? Oh, unnatural. There's only one thing worse, taking it with a slice of lemon in it. You might as well draw it from a bothersome samovar at once and be done with it. The samovar is picturesque. It is insincere, like Californians, natives. Well, I can think of something much worse than tea with lemon in it. What? No tea at all. Mrs. Summers recollecting herself. Oh, poor Mr. Campbell. Two lumps? One, thank you. Your pity is so sweet. You ought to have thought of the milk of human kindness and spared my cream jug, too. You didn't pour out your compassion soon enough. Bemis, who has been sipping his tea in silent admiration. Are you often able to keep it up in that way? I was fancying myself at the theatre. Oh, don't encore us. Mr. Campbell would keep saying his things over indefinitely. Campbell presenting his cup. Another lump. It's turned bitter. Two. Ha, ha, ha. Very good. Very good indeed. Thank you kindly, Mr. Bemis. Mrs. Summers greeting the new arrivals and leaning forward to shake hands with them as they come up without rising. Mrs. Roberts, how very good of you. And Mr. Roberts. Scene 3. Mr. and Mrs. Roberts and the others. Not at all. Of course we were coming. Will you have some tea? You see I'm installed already. Mr. Campbell was so greedy he wouldn't wait. Mr. Bemis and I are here in the character of heroes, and we had to have our tea at once. You're a hero too, Roberts, though you don't look it. Anyone who comes to tea in such weather is a hero or a... Mrs. Summers interrupting him with a little shriek. Oh, how hot that handle's getting. I dare say. Let me turn out my sister's cup. Pouring out the tea and handing it to Mrs. Roberts. I don't see how you could reconcile it to your number eleven conscience to leave your children in such a snowstorm as this, Agnes. Mrs. Roberts in vague alarm. Why, what in the world could happen to them, Willis? Oh, nothing to them. But suppose Roberts got snowed under. Have some tea, Roberts. He offers to pour out a cup. Mrs. Summers dispossessing him of the teapot with dignity. Thank you, Mr. Campbell. I will pour out the tea. Oh, very well. I thought the handle was hot. It's cooler now. And you won't let me help you. When there are more people, you may hand the tea. I wish I knew just how much that meant. Very little. As little as an adoptive Californian in his most earnest mood. While they talk, Campbell bending over the teapot on which Mrs. Summers keeps her hand, the others form a little group apart. Bemis to Mrs. Roberts. I hope Mr. Roberts' distinguished friend won't give us the slip on account of the storm. Oh, no, he'll be sure to come. He may be late, but he's the most amiable of Englishmen, and I know he won't disappoint Mrs. Summers. The most unamiable of Englishmen couldn't do that. Ah, I don't know. Did you meet Mr. Pogus? No, what did he do? Why, he came to the Hibbins' dinner in a sack coat. I thought it was a cardigan jacket. I heard a Norfolk jacket and knickerbockers. Ah, there is Mrs. Kerwin. To Campbell, aside. 
and without her husband or any one else's husband for shame you began it mrs summers to mrs kerwin who approaches her sofa you are kindness itself mrs kerwin to come on such a day the ladies press each other's hands scene four mrs kerwin and the others you are goodness in person mrs summers to say so and i am magnanimity embodied let me introduce myself mrs kerwin he bows and mrs kerwin deeply curtsies i should never have known you campbell melodramatically to mrs summers tea ho for mrs kerwin impenetrably disguised as kindness what shall i say to him mrs summers pouring the tea anything you like mrs kerwin aren't we to see mr kerwin to-day mrs kerwin taking her tea no i'm his insufficient apology he's detained at his office business then you see they don't all come mrs summers all what oh all the heroes is that what he was going to say mrs summers you never can tell what he's going to say i should think you would be afraid of him mrs summers with a little shrug oh no he's quite harmless it's just a little way he has to mr and mrs miller mr and mrs alfred bemis and dr lawton who all appear together ah how do you do so glad to see you so very kind of you i didn't suppose you would venture out and you too doctor she begins to pour out tea for them one after another with great zeal scene five dr lawton mr and mrs miller young mr and mrs bemis and the others yes i too it sounded very much as if i were brutus also he stirs his tea and stares round at the company it seems to me that i have met these conspirators before that's what makes boston insupportable you're always meeting the same people we all feel it as keenly as you do doctor lawton looking sharply at him oh you here i might have expected it where is your aunt scene six mrs crashaw and the others mrs crashaw appearing if you mean me dr lawton i do my dear friend what company is complete without you mrs summers reaching forward to take her hand while with her disengaged hand she begins to pour her a cup of tea none in my house very pretty taking her tea i hope it isn't complete either without the english painter you promised us no indeed and a great many other people besides but haven't you met him yet i supposed mrs roberts oh i don't go to all of agnes's fandigos i was to have seen him at mrs wheeler's he is being asked everywhere of course but he didn't come he sent his father and mother instead they were very nice old people but they hadn't painted his pictures they might say his pictures would never have been painted without them it was like highness going to visit rachel by appointment she wasn't in but her father and mother were and when he met her afterward he told her that he had just come from a show where he had seen a curious monster advertised for exhibition the offspring of a hare and a salmon the monster was not to be seen at the moment but the showman said here was monsieur the hare and madame the salmon what in the world did rachel say ah that's what these brilliant anecdotes never tell and i think it would be very interesting to know what the victim of a witticism has to say i should think you would know very often doctor ah now i should like to know what the victim of a compliment says he bows his thanks 
Dr. Lawton makes a profound obeisance to which Mrs. Kerwin responds in burlesque. We all envy you, Doctor. Oh, yes. Mrs. Kerwin never makes a compliment without meaning it. I can't say that quite, my dear. I should be very sorry to mean all the civil things I say, but I never flatter gentlemen of a certain age. Mrs. Miller tittering ineffectively. I shall know what to say to Mr. Miller after this. Well, if you haven't got the man, Mrs. Summers, you have got his picture, haven't you? Yes, it's on my writing desk in the library. Let me... No, no, don't disturb yourself. We wish to tear it to pieces without your embarrassing presence. Will you take my arm, Mrs. Crashaw? Oh, let us all go and see it. Aren't you coming, Willis? Campbell, without looking round. Thank you, I've seen it. Mrs. Summers, whom the withdrawal of her other guests has left alone with him. How could you tell such a fib? I could tell much worse fibs than that in such a cause. What cause? A lost one, I'm afraid. Will you answer my question, Amy? Did you ask me any? You know I did before those people came in. Oh, that. Yes. I should like to ask you a question first. Twenty, if you like. Why do you feel authorised to call me by my first name? Because I love you. Now will you answer me? I didn't say I would, did I? Campbell, rising sadly. Oh, no. Mrs. Summers, mechanically taking the hand he offers her. Oh, what? I'm going, that's all. So soon? Yes, but I'll try to make amends by not coming back soon, or at all. You mustn't. Mustn't what? You mustn't keep my hand. Here comes some more people. Ah, Mrs. Canfield, Miss Bailey. So very nice of you, Mrs. Wharton. Will you have some tea? Scene 7 Mrs. Campbell, Miss Bailey, Mrs. Wharton, and the others. No, thank you. The only objection to afternoon tea is the tea. I'm so glad you don't mind the weather. With her hand on the teapot, glancing up at Miss Bailey. And do you refuse, too? I can answer for Mrs. Canfield that she doesn't and I never do. We object to the weather. Mrs. Summers pouring a cup of tea. That makes it a little more difficult. I can keep from offering Mrs. Wharton some tea, but I can't stop it snowing. Miss Bailey taking her cup. But you're so amiable. We know you would if you could, and that's quite enough. We're not the first and only, are we? Dear, no. There are multitudes of flattering spirits in the library, stopping the mouth of my portrait with pretty speeches. Not your Bramford portrait. My Bramford portrait. Miss Bailey to the other ladies. Oh, let us go and see it too. They flutter out of the drawing-room, where Mrs. Summers and Campbell remain alone together as before. He continues silent while she waits for him to speak. Scene 8 Mrs. Summers, Mr. Campbell Mrs. Summers, finally. Well? Well what? Nothing. Only I thought you were... you were going to... No, I've got nothing to say. I didn't mean that. I thought you were going to go. She puts up her hand and hides a triumphant little smile with it. Very well, then, I'll go, since you wish it. He holds out his hand. Mrs. Summers putting hers behind her. You've shaken hands once. Besides, who said I wished you to go? Do you wish me to stay? I wish you to hand tea to people. And you won't say anything more? It seems to me that's enough. It isn't enough for me. 
but i suppose beggars mustn't be choosers i can't stay merely to hand tea to people however you can say yes or no now amy as well as any other time well no then if you wish it so much you know i don't wish it you gave me my choice i thought you were indifferent about the word you know better than that amy amy again aren't you a little previous mr campbell campbell with a sigh ah that's for you to say wouldn't it be impolite oh not for you if you're so sarcastic i shall be afraid of you under what circumstances mrs summers dropping her eyes i don't know he makes a rush upon her oh here comes mrs cowen shake hands as if you were going scene nine mrs kerwin mrs summers mr campbell what is mr campbell going to to you're not going mrs kerwin yes i'm going the likeness is perfect mrs summers it's a speaking likeness if there ever was one did it do all the talking it would if mrs roberts and dr lawton hadn't been there well i must go so must i must you yes these drifts will be over my ears directly you poor man you don't mean to say you're walking i shall be in about half a minute indeed you shall not you shall be driving with me i've a vacancy in the coupe and i'll set you down wherever you like won't it crowd you not at all or incommode you in any way it will oblige me in every way then i will go and a thousand thanks good-bye again mrs summers good-bye mrs summers poor mrs summers it seems too bad to leave you here alone bowed in an elegic attitude over your tea-urn oh not at all remember me to mr kerwin i will well mr campbell mr campbell well to which both neither <laughs> mr campbell do you know much about women i had a mother oh a mother won't do well i have an only sister who is a woman a sister won't do either not your own you can't learn a woman's meaning in that way i will sit at your feet mrs kerwin if you'll instruct me i shall be delighted i'll begin now oh you needn't really prostrate yourself she stops him in a burlesque attempt to do so and i'll concentrate the wisdom of the whole first lesson in a single word campbell with clasped hands of entreaty speak blessed ghost stay <laughs> she flies at mrs summers and kisses her you can't say i'm ill-natured my dear whatever i am mrs summers pursuing her exit with the word no merely atrocious a pause ensues in which campbell stands irresolute scene ten mrs summers mr campbell campbell finally did you wish me to stay amy mrs summers airily i oh no it was mrs cohen then i think i'll accept her kind offer of a seat in her coupe oh i thought of course you'd stay at her request no i shall only stay at yours and i shall not ask you in fact i warn you not to why because if you urge me to speak now i shall say i wasn't going to urge you no matter 
i shall say it now without being urged yes i've made up my mind i can't marry a flirt i can amy sir you know very well you sent those people into the other room to keep me here and torment me now you've insulted me and all is over to tantalize me with your loveliness your beauty your grace amy mrs summers softening oh that's all very well i'm glad you like it i could go on at much greater length but you know i love you dearly amy and why should you delight in my agonies but only marry me and you shall delight in them as long as you live and you must hold me very cheap to think i would take you from that creature confound her i wasn't hers to give i offered myself first she offered you last and no thank you please do you really mean it i shall not say or oh, yes i will say if that woman who seems to have you at her beck and call had not intermeddled i might have made you a very different answer but now my eyes are opened and i see what i should have to expect and no thank you please and if she hadn't offered me mrs summers drawing out her handkerchief and putting it to her eyes i was feeling kindly toward you i was such a little fool amy and you knew how much i disliked her yes i saw by the way you kissed each other nonsense you knew that meant nothing but if it had been anybody else in the world but her i shouldn't have minded it and now 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 all these geese are coming back from the other room and they'll see that i've been crying and everybody will know everything willis <gasps> willis let me go i must bathe my eyes you stay here and receive them i'll be back at once she escapes from the arm stretched toward her and out of the door just before her guests enter from the library and campbell remains to receive them the ladies in returning call over one another's heads and shoulders scene eleven mr campbell and the others amy it's lovely but it doesn't half do you justice it's too sweet for anything, Mrs. Summers. Why did you let the man put you into that ridiculous 17th century dress? Can't he paint a modern frock? But what exquisite coloring, Mrs. Summers. He's got just your lovely turn of the head. And the way you hold your fan! What character he's thrown into it! And that fall of the skirt, Amy, that skirt is full of character. She discovers Mr. Campbell behind the tea urn. He has Mrs. Summers' light wrap on his shoulders and her fan in his hand, and he alternately hides his blushes with it and coquettishly folds and pats his mouth in a gross caricature of Mrs. Summers' manner. In rising, he twitches his coat forward in a similar burlesque of a lady's management of her skirt. Why, where is Amy Willis? Gone a moment. Some trouble about the hot water hot water that you've been getting into ah young man look me in the eye your glass one doctor why my dear has your father got a glass eye of course he hasn't what an idea i don't know what mr campbell means i've no doubt he wishes i had a glass eye two of them for that matter but that isn't answering my question where is mrs summers that was my sister's question and i did answer it have some tea ladies i'm glad you like my portrait and that you think he's got my lovely turn of the head and the way i hold my fan and the character of my skirt but i agree with you that it isn't half as pretty as i am oh what shall we do to him prescribe for us doctor no no i want the doctor's services myself i don't want him to give me his medicines 
I want him to give me away. You're tired of giving yourself away, then? It's of no use. They won't have me. Who won't? Oh, I'll leave Mrs. Summers to say. Scene 12. Mrs. Summers and the Others. Mrs. Summers radiantly reappearing. Say what? She has hidden the traces of her tears from every one but the ladies by a light application of powder, and she knows that they all know she has been crying, and this makes her a little more smiling. Say what? She addresses the company in general rather than Campbell. Campbell with caricatured tenderness. Say yes. What does he mean, doctor? Oh, I'm afraid he's passed all surgery. I give him over to you, Mrs. Summers. There now, she wasn't the last to do it. Mrs. Summers with the resolution of a widow. Well, I suppose there's nothing else for it, then. I'll see what can be done for your patient, doctor. She passes her hand through Campbell's arm, where he continues to stand behind the tea-table. Mrs. Roberts falling upon her and kissing her. Amy, you don't mean it. Mrs. Bemis embracing her in turn. I never can believe it. It is ridiculous. What? Willis. It does seem too nice to be true. You astonish us. We never should have dreamed of it. You must give us time to realize it. Is it possible? Is it possible? They all shake hands with Mrs. Summers in turn. Isn't this rather sudden, Willis? Well, it is for Mrs. Summers, perhaps, but I've found it awfully gradual. Nonsense. It's an old story for both of us. Well, what I like about it is it's true, founded on fact. I can't believe it. Well, I don't know whom all this charming incredulity is intended to flatter. But if it's I, I say no, not really at all. It's merely a little coup de théâtre we've been arranging. Lawton patting him on the shoulder. One ahead, as usual. Oh, thank you, Doctor. There are two of us ahead now. I believe you, at any rate. Bravo! He initiates an applause in which all the rest join, while Campbell catches up Mrs. Summers' fan and unfurls it before both their faces. End of Five O'Clock Tea This recording is in the public domain.